today's speaker is Dr. Tsukan Xiao. Uh, Tsukan did his PhD at the University of Cambridge under the supervision of Professor Chris Ford. His PhD thesis was entitled A Single Photon Source Based on La La Lateral NIP Junction Driven by a Surface Acoustic Wave. Uh, and after his PhD at the University of Cambridge, uh, uh, Dr. Xiao moved on to be a postdoctoral researcher at TU Delft in Professor van der Seipen's group. And today, uh, Zukan is going to tell us about the super interesting work that's been going on on building real quantum computers and using them to solve real quantum computations. So, so we're really excited to hear about, about the work at TU Delft, Sukan. So thank you very much for joining us. And, and, and with these words, the, the virtual floor is yours. Great, yeah, thanks, uh, Demis, for sharing. Good morning, everyone, uh, or people in other part of the world, uh, afternoon or something. Uh, so my name is Zgan. I actually, yeah, as David just introduced, I graduated from uh, Cavendish. And uh, it was very, it's very nice to be back, although it's just online to give a seminar about uh, our recent work uh, in the quantum simulation um, field. And so first I need to start by thanking all the group members from the Van der Seifen group for the supporting and all the discussions. Uh, and also uh, this work is actually uh, a collaboration with my lab partner, Dr. Shark Van Dijpen. Now he's in, he's a poster in, uh, uh, in Copenhagen. Uh, okay, so my talk, yeah, I will just give a quick uh, show introduction or outline of the talk today. And I will first give a very brief introduction to the analog quantum simulation. And I will introduce how we can use gate defined quantum dial arrays as a quantum simulator. And I will briefly review two previous works, uh, which we use quantum dots to do. Uh, from your harbor simulation. And then I will go to the, the main part of my talk, which we use a, a linear chain of four spins to do quantum simulation of antiferromagnetic Heisenberg spin chain. Okay. okay. So yeah, so let's start by, uh, yeah. So why do you want to do quantum simulation? So you can imagine that if you want to simulate a quantum mechanical system, we say, 50 couple two level systems using classical computer. You will need a computer that can store two to the power of 50 numbers and, that, and also can calculate a matrix of two to the power of 11 elements. That's uh, beyond the capability of classical computer today. So that's why Richard Feynman uh, said that if you want to make a simulation of nature, you will better make it quantum mechanical. And actually this motivates the whole uh, development of quantum computer these days. And to do, so there are different ways to do quantum simulation. So one is uh, what we usually call digital quantum simulation. So in the digital quantum simulation, we encode uh, an initial state as some qubit inputs, and then uh, we build our unitary operator using discrete qubit gates so that uh, those discrete qubit gate combined together, that will gives you the new unitary operation uh, to, yeah, to, to observe how this initial state evolved under a certain Hamiltonian you want to simulate. And then we finally, we do a final qubit measurement to, uh, to tell you the state evolution under this Hamiltonian. Uh, however, to do this, you actually need a universal high photoelectric photo quantum computer which requires lots of physical qubits and good uh, error correction algorithms, uh, which people are still trying to develop, to, are still trying to develop now. Uh, so we don't have this at this moment, okay? So then uh, what can we do with today's uh, small, you can say small scale quantum system or quantum computers? Uh, in general, uh, what we can do is uh, we call analog quantum simulation. So instead of uh, building your ha simulation Hamiltonian using 
discrete cub cub uh, cubic gates, we can actually engineer a Hamiltonian of a highly controllable quantum mechanical system such that this, uh, the Hamiltonian of your simulator can be mapped to the problem you want to study. And usually a good simulator has a better control than the system that you want to simulate. So that means you have many knobs that you can tune to turn on maybe one of the coupling or make one smaller, things like that, things like that. And also it often allows you to probe the state or the correlation of individual quantum elements in this simulator. So basically that gives you more insight of what happens. So you just, you don't just uh, look at the mic, uh, uh, the big picture of, of the uh, material, something you actually see the mic microscopic picture of individual quantum element in this uh, simulator. Sometimes that actually gives you more insight. And uh, yeah. So, one example is that people can use ultra cold thermonic uh, atoms to observe a spin charge separation. So, for example, the idea is that you first form a chain of uh, cold atoms and then uh, atoms in different species correspond to different spins. And then if you, at some time, you dope a hole in this chain and you will see that uh, this hole move with a certain uh, velocity. Uh, however, the spin excitation in this spin chain will move in a different, uh, in a different speed. That's because uh, this hole moved because of the tunnel coupling and this uh, spin excitation it's moved by uh, exchange coupling, so that you can see that the uh, the slope, the speed of this uh, hole and this spin excitation they move uh, in different speed. So you can actually directly observe this effect in the quantum simulator. And also, you can uh, use red red atoms to study IC model disorder to order phase transition. Yeah, uh, because you can uh, do an image of this this chain of uh, radio atoms. So you can actually, uh, yeah, to, to see how many domain walls you have if you, if you change the detuning. And from there, you can see uh, an order to disorder phase transition. And the final example I'll give is uh, people can use superconducting circuits to uh, simulate a quantum random walk in both hardware model. Uh, the idea is that, for example, you can, uh, Put, you can excite uh, a qubit here, and then you turn on all the exchanges in this, uh, in this lattice, and you can see that initial, this initial excitation will propagate in, in the lattice. And you can see that how this initial state uh, propagates as a function of time. Yeah. So these are the three examples that people can use different uh, quantum computing platforms or just, uh, yeah, content platforms to assimilators to study different kind of physics. And uh, what um, we want to share- Sorry, Tsukan, yeah. I have a question here from, from sure. someone in, in the chat. They sure. asked, can you solve any circuit, um, can you solve any circuit problem using analog quantum simulations? I think the question is, can you solve any quantum problem or any quantum algorithm using this approach? Uh, certainly not. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, because the question we can solve depend, actually depends on the platform uh, we're using. For example, uh, for the radar atom, it's suitable for study icing model. And if you have this uh, formonic atoms, it's good to study Fermi Harbor model. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it depends on. So, with different platforms, it has some, uh, it's, more, it's probably more suitable to study certain, certain kind of physics, certain kind of model uh, rather than others. Yeah. And so that's why it's, it's so that's why if we sometimes, if a, uh, someday you have a good uh, universal quantum computer, then this digital quantum simulation can, in principle can uh, give you the simulation for uh, any types of, any types of model. Yeah, so that's the main difference between, yeah. You can say that's the main difference between the analog and the digital quantum simulation. So the analog uh, simulation, it uh, yeah, it does not allow you to simulate all kinds of uh, physics. Yeah. Okay, I think that's. Uh, I hope that's clear. I think that's a good answer. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, and also the initial states we can prepare in those uh, analog quantum simulator is not always, we, we probably cannot uh, uh, prepare all the possible input states in the, quantum, in the analog quantum simulator. Right, okay, so now let's go to uh, quantum dots. So we want to add quantum dot arrays into the family of quantum simulator. And we, I hope to show you uh, in this talk that the content, the, de, the gate defined content array is actually an ideal platform for Fermi Harbor and Heisenberg uh, simulation. Okay. And then, okay, let's dive in. Let's, let me give you some brief introduction. What is a content array? Uh, so, a content array is a small nanostructure that you can define. Uh, individual small pockets of electrons or holes uh, in uh, in the in a one D or two D arrays. For example, you can have a double dot, so you can see that you have basically like two positions that you can hold uh, electrons, and then you can also have a two by two array, and you can also have a one by a. In this day, people have actually have achieved three by three or even four by four. So the size of quantum dot array is actually growing these days. And uh, uh, so this is the, uh, the top view of a quantum dot. So how do you actually form a quantum dot? So the idea is that you want to confine the uh, electron spin in a quantum dot by first confine it in the z direction by uh, growing a heat structure so that you have a 2D electron gas at interface of say, for example, a gas sign and our gas, or you can also do it in the silicon, silicon germanium quantum world. So by, so by providing the, the current in the Z direction, and then after that, uh, you add, you pattern surface gates on the, on the surface of your heat structure, and then you apply gate voltages to help you to shape the potential profiles in this uh, 2D electron gas. So then if you apply uh, proper voltages, you can actually shape uh, your potential looks like this so that you have two small pockets and each small pocket you can use it to confine uh, electrons. So yeah, that's why you have one, dot, one corner dot here and one corner dot here. And they can be coupled by the tunnel coupling between these two corner dots. And why the quantum dot array can work as a Fermi Harbor simulator, uh, it's because if you look at the, uh, the Fermi Harbor model, here we have the tunnel coupling turn and we have the, uh, the charging energy turn. And then in the extended uh, the version, we have the inter-site interaction and we have the local energy offset. All these turns, uh, we have the control. Uh, in the quantum dot array. So basically we can essentially control all these different parameters in the quantum dot array. So as I say that when you pat after you pattern those gates, uh, you confine electrons in each uh, quantum dots. And then by uh, scanning the voltage of say this gate and this gate, you actually control the, the depths of those, uh, those pockets or these quantum dots. So you can change how many electrons you want to put in in each quantum dot. So then by scanning this gate and versus this gate, you can actually probe the number of charges in, uh, in your, your double dot system. Uh, so I will talk about this signal later, but you can see that you can, we can change the number of uh, charges from uh, zero, one, meaning zero electron uh, in the left dot and one electron in the right dot. And we can, we can change it to zero, two, or one, one, or one, two. Yeah, so we can change the number of electrons in each dot. And we can also, by controlling the barriers between the two dots to control the, uh, the tunnel couplings between uh, these electrons. So then you can see that if you scan across this one, zero, zero, one inter-dot transition, and you change the inter-dot tunnel couplings, you can see that your, uh, your, uh, your number of charge will actually, uh, your charge signal will actually start to hybridize because of this, uh, 
this interdoctrinal coupling. So that just shows you that by con by uh, by add by adding uh, gate voltages to the the conductor arrays, we can control uh, the tunnel couplings and uh, uh, the filling of the dot. And then the inner dot interaction and the and the, the charging energy is mainly determined by uh, the design of the quantum dots. So basically, if you put two dots closer, you will have a larger inter intersign interaction. And if you make the dot say smaller, your charging energy will be larger. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, we can actually measure. So how do we measure the, the number of charges in each quantum dot? We have a thing called charge sensor. So the idea is that you have a quantum point context uh, very close to your quantum dot system. And then uh, this, it turns out that the conductance through this quantum point contact is very sensitive to uh, the electrostatic uh, environment in this uh, double in this double dot system, so that means if you add one electron to this dot, you will actually see a very uh, large change in terms of the conductance through uh, this quantum point contact. So by measuring, so, so basically by measuring the con the conductance through this point quantum point contact, you can detect whether you have uh, you have a charge tunnel in or out or or not. Yeah. So you can tell like how many charges you have in this, uh, in this uh, quantum dot array system. And uh, alternatively, you can also just make another quantum dot that close by your uh, uh, quantum dot, your main uh, array that you want to observe. So you have this sensor dot that very close to uh, your uh, one by eight quantum dot array. And then again, by measuring the conductance through uh, this sensor dot, uh, you actually get a signal like this. So this is the, the conductance versus uh, the voltage of this gate. So uh, here you see a Coulomb peak. That is when one of the single particle level align with uh, the Fermi with the reservoir here. And then you can see that if you have if you have n electrons, so say you have n electron in dot seven here. If you have n electron, your conductance is here. But if you add one more electron you actually change, you basically add an extra gating to your uh, sensor that will shift your conductance to this point. So by measuring the conductance through the sensor dots, that tells you uh, you, have a, uh, you have addition charge into your quantum dot system. And then by using a uh, reflectometry uh, skill, we can uh, achieve a charge readout in a few microseconds. And uh, we can also couple two spins using uh, exchange Sorry, coupling. Sukan, there is another ah, yes. question here from the chat. There's sure. someone asking, what's the fidelity of your readout? Uh, the fidelity is readout. Uh, it's uh, quite high. We did not really, uh, I would say above 99, uh, okay. but still it depends on how, like if you read out like these two charge, because it's very close to, the sensor, uh, the signal is really high. Uh, it's yeah, it's I think it's potentially is above ninety nine. But then say if you want to use this sensor to read out a charge addition to this dot, apparently it's gonna be the signal is gonna be much weaker, right? Uh, so that really depends on uh, which quantum dot you are sensing. Right. This, this sensor, yeah. But I would okay. say typically the the nearby quantum dots we can measure them with very high uh, fidelity. Yeah. Would you then like shuttle the ones at one, two down so that they're closer to the sensor dot or, or, or how? Yeah, would they, this, yeah, this, uh, yeah, it's possible to do this. Yes, it's possible to shuttle the dot to here to measure it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Or you can also do some kind of a, a swap operation or uh, doing some technique. Uh, we actually published earlier, it's called Cascade. It's been read out to map uh, uh, initial charge state transition to uh, to a nearby charge sensor, so you can read out, uh, yeah, you can read out using a charge sensor. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And yeah, so and we can also control the exchange couplings between two spins. Uh, 
So but to understand this, let's look at the, uh, this 1, 1 to 0, 2 charge transition. So by, if you scan along this direction, and if we uh, plot all the uh, different energy, the, the energy diagram for different states, you will see that you have this uh, singlet 0, 2. So a singlet state, meaning uh, you have a up, down, minus, down, up, a spin state. Okay, so you have a singlet 0, 2. So meaning that these two spins, they occupy the same dot. Okay, or, or you can also have a singlet 1, 1. That means that these two spins occupy different dots. And you can have a, a triplet state, triplet 1, 1. And then if you plot the energy diagram as a function of this detuning, which is uh, in this direction, basically you are basically change the relative energy uh, between the two uh, quantum dots. And by doing that, you can see that uh, the energy splitting between the, the lowest singlet branch and the, sing the triplet state actually changes as a function of the detuning. So basically, the, the, this energy difference between the single state and the triple state is the effective exchange couplings between the speeds. So you can see here that by changing the detuning, you can actually modulate the, uh, the amplitude of the exchange couplings. And by changing the exchange couplings, uh, you can see that if you prepare, say if you prepare a down up initial state and you turn on the exchange coupling between the two spins, which means uh, say initially you are roughly here and you and uh, because of some small magnetic gradient, your uh, eigenstate is a down up and then you quickly change your detuning to here, meaning that you quickly turn on your exchange and then this initial uh, down up state will start to uh, coherently evolve under this exchange Hamiltonian. So it will evolve uh, between the down up and up down state. So if you measure the, uh, the down up probability as a function of the, the detuning and time, you will see this kind of coherent oscillation. So this is a coherent exchange uh, oscillation between two spins. Uh, okay. so. Yes, we can couple two spins via exchange couplings, but then how do we actually measure them? How do we measure those spins? Uh, so uh, a traditional way is what we call uh, a spin energy dependent readout. But now I want to talk about a more uh, a method that becoming more and more popular these days is what we call a poly spin block K readout. It's a readout that uh, makes you to mesh that allows you to measure uh, the correlation between two spins. Uh, so by, so in the, this poly spin block here readout, you can distinguish a single state from the triplet states. So the idea is that if you have a single state and you try to push the two spins into the same quantum dots, you know that because the, the single state in the spin sector uh, spin degree of freedom, they have anti-symmetric uh, wave function. That means that the orbital degree of freedom can be uh, symmetric. So that means you, it's, possible, it's possible to push them into the same dots. So if you try to do that, you can uh, go from a 1-1 one, one charge state to a 0-2 charge state. However, if, you, if your uh, spin state is one of these triplets, then and you try to do this uh, poly spin block here readout, you will find that these two spins will still remain in the one one charge state because they cannot occupy the same orbital. So by measuring, so by trying to, to push two electrons to the same dot and then measure whether the charge state is in the Z one one or zero two, you can distinguish uh, a single state or a, a triplet state. So here is a histogram when you measure, uh, if you randomly load two spins and you measure uh, the outcome, you got two peaks and one peak correspond to the single outcome. The other peak correspond to a triplet outcome. Okay, is that uh, all clear? Okay. 
Okay, and as I said earlier, that because there is a many knobs that we can tune in the quantum dot array, so we can actually use it as a Fermi Harbor simulator. Uh, one example uh, from our group is that we can actually tune the tunnel couplings between three dots, and then we can go from a, a more insulated region to a more a metallic like um, region by basically tuning the tunnel couplings between these two. So you have this, uh, this more to uh, metal transition. And there's another ex uh, example from our group is that uh, we study something called Nagoka ferromagnetism. The idea is that if we put, if, if you have a two by two array, uh, and if you put one hole in this two by two, so meaning you have only have three spin in this two by two array, then the ground state will actually be ferromagnetic. That is because uh, this hole wants to move freely in uh, this system so that uh, if, if all spins are, line, are all aligned, that actually lower the kinetic energy of the system. So your ground state become uh, ferromagnetic. And in our, in our group, we actually probe uh, the property of the ground state and found out indeed it's, uh, it's ferromagnetic. Okay. And, okay, and one, one cool thing about the quantum dot is that we can control every individual tunnel couplings in this system. And so we can actually change the, the topology of this, of this system from a ring, basically a, a couple of two by two array. And we can actually decouple these two, uh, these two quantum dots by essentially redu reduce, by reducing the tunnel couplings between these two, Make, make a system effectively become a 1D chain. And we can see that uh, if, you make it, if you make it a 1D chain and this uh, Nagoka ferromagnetism disappears. So that's, this is a very good example to show that we have a good control over this system. And by using the same device, you can actually uh, probe uh, the system in different regions. And that gives you more insight of the, uh, of the system or the physics you want to study. Okay, so now we finally go to the main part of my talk, uh, which is quantum simulation of Heisenberg spin chain. Uh, okay, so uh, when the charging in, in the Fermi Harbor model, when your charging energy is much, uh, is much larger than the tunnel couplings, then the charges will be localized and only the spin degree of freedom remains. And in this case, the, in this region, the Fermi Harbor model is reduced to the Heisenberg model. And you can write down your Heisenberg model like this. And then essentially the J is, uh, will be a function of the tunnel coupling and the, the charging energy. So you will have in our, in our system, we will study, it's a, a, it's a four spin system and we will want to uh, control the exchange couplings between say spin one and spin two, which is uh, J12, and you have also control J23 and J34. We have, we'll, we'll have independent control of all these three exchange couplings, and we'll uh, see uh, how the, the spin state uh, evolve if we change uh, the exchange couplings. And one of the goal we want to achieve in this work is that we want to make uh, all, exchange, all exchanges to be the same in the homogeneous exchange condition. And then in this case, our uh, ground state will be antiferromagnetic, it will be an antiferromagnetic ground state. And then if you write down this antiferromagnetic ground state, it looks like this, it's pretty messy, but you can see that uh, it's actually a four spin entangled state. And uh, we can also write down this exact same state using different bases. Uh, for example, you can write it down in the, in the single triplet basis. And in this case, we write down in the one, two single triplet and three, four single triplet basis. So you can see that by, we can write down this exact same state like this. So uh, it's a superposition of the single one, two, single three, four product state. Uh, and 
the other part is the, the superposition of uh, triplet product states. And it's a triple, it's a superposition, uh, superposition of these two, uh, these four different product states, basically. Yeah. And you can also write down the same state in a different basis, say in a one, four, and two, three single triple basis. Yeah. And why we want to write down in this kind of basis? Because as I mentioned earlier, we will do uh, PSP, we will do poly spin blockade readout. And what we measure is the single triplet uh, probability, single triplet outcome. So in this space, this space is, uh, is more convenient for us to, uh, to see the outcome of this uh, interferometric ground state. And then uh, I'll quickly go through this slide. Uh, because we have uh, four spins, so that, that tells you that actually there will be 16 spin states. And then uh, we can divide this uh, 16 spin states into different, uh, uh, different subspaces. And each subspaces have different total spin and different uh, spin Z component. Yeah. And in this work, we will mainly focus on this subspace, which is the, uh, the global singlet subspace and also this global triplet subspace, yeah? And then uh, actually in this uh, uh, global single subspace, you have two states. One is the single single product state and the other state is the, tri the superposition of triplet triplet product states. And you can write down it's Hamiltonian like this. And then there's another subspace we are interested in is the, the global triplet states. And you have these three states one is the singlet triplet state and the other is the triplet single state. And the third one is the uh, superposition of uh, triplet triplet states. You can also write down the Hamiltonian for this subspace. Yep. And uh, now I'll describe the, the general experiment pulse sequence in the experiment. So first, or we operate near the one 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 charge states because uh, in this case that this is yeah, sorry close sorry to, to interrupt yeah. you again Sukan. Sure. Uh, and I, I have a question here and, and the person writes uh, maybe you mentioned it and I'm sorry if I missed it the device that you're using here is that a silicon device or what material is your device made from oh yeah okay yeah so sorry uh, I did not mention this it's a guy it's a guy device it's a uh, Dope gas night device. Okay, so, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thanks uh, for reminding me. <clears throat> uh, yep, yeah. so in this work, we operate near the 1111 charge space. So basically, we have one charge in each quantum dots, and then uh, we operate near this one charge state so that uh, it's the it's mainly the, the spin degree of freedom remains. And to start the experiment, we was, we was by starting uh, preparing some initial spin states, which could be uh, a single single product state or maybe a triple single product state. I, I will uh, mention that later. And then we first prepare certain initial states, and then we will turn on the exchange couplings to uh, make the four spin system evolve for some time, right? And then after some time, we will isolate, again, isolate uh, uh, the spins into pairs. So it could be this uh, left and the right pairs, or we can isolate the spins so that we only measure the middle pair, yeah? And then after isolating them, we do uh, the poly spin blockade to see whether these two spins are in the triple state or the single states. <clears throat> so this is the whole, uh, the basic experiment uh, protocols. There is another, another question here. And yeah. it says, for your time axis, what kind of time scales do you have for your manipulations? Also, could you tell us what the T2 star time is? Yeah, okay. So the, uh, the time scale we have, is the, the, the resolution we have uh, is in order of one nanosecond. So we can control our length of our pulse uh, in, the, in one microsecond resolution. 
And the T2 star in this work, it's about, I think I would say it's about uh, 30 to 50 nanosecond. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And when you're doing the separation, for example, or isolation, how long mm -hmm. does that operation take? Oh, that's just, just for one or two nanosecond. Yeah. So it is within like the speed at which you can control this. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yes. yes. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I need to first talk about the four spin readout. Uh, so for example, I mentioned earlier that we can separate uh, or isolate the, the middle two spins and then uh, project them into the single triplet uh, uh, basis. So by doing this, we get uh, some probably to be uh, in a single state and some, some outcome in the triplet states if we measure this, okay? And we can also do a different type of measurements by actually doing a correlation measurement of these two pairs, yeah? So actually by doing this measurement, uh, it's obviously to see that you actually have four different outcomes because one outcome is that you measure a singlet in this pair and you also measure a singlet in this pair. In this case, in your histogram, in your signal, you got uh, a peak like here. So this peak is when you have a single singlet uh, outcome and maybe you have a triplet singlet outcome, then you got a signal here. And yeah, in these two, uh, this, the other two picks give you a single triplet or triplet triplet outcome. Uh, and just this just tells you that we can get uh, the correlation between two pairs by performing this uh, sequential single triplet uh, measurements. Um, so Tsukan, I have another question in the chat. I think it relates to the previous question. So there's yeah. a question, why is the T2 star uh, time larger than the typical 10 nanoseconds? Uh, let's see. Okay, I maybe I shouldn't say, yeah, I shouldn't say T2 star is, is that kind of skill. I was, yeah, I, I think it's about, yeah, 10, 10 to 20 nanosecond, but then you can still observe the coherent effect after 30 to 50 nanosecond. I think that's what I want to say. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so uh, by doing the, the single triplet correlation measurements, uh, we can basically get our spin states uh, of these uh, four spin systems. And so, so now I need to talk about uh, the spin initialization. So how do we initialize a single single state? It's actually quite easy because as I mentioned earlier that if two electrons occupy the same dots, uh, they will have to occupy, they will have to be in the single state. Otherwise they can occupy the same orbital. So it's very easy to initialize a single, single product state. You just start from a zero to zero to charge transition. Uh, sorry, from a zero to zero to charge state. And then you separate those spins by going to the one, 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 one charge state. So by doing that, you can easily initialize uh, a, a single single product state like this. And you can see that uh, this is a check that we do right after the state initialization. So if we first just separate them, then we quickly do uh, a single triplet correlation measurement. You see that basically all the outcomes appears in the single single uh, uh, region. Yeah, uh, so this tells you that we have very good single single uh, initialization uh, and also that and also you, there sometimes might be some uh, state that cause of this uh, thermal boring or something that you actually do not start from the uh, correct initial state you might have very small amount of time that you, you start from a triple state or triple single or single triplet maybe but we can do a post selection only select the uh, the shaft that where we start from a single single uh, initial state. And we can use similar technique uh, to initialize a triple single states. To do that, we randomly load two spins 
in the left pair. And then we do uh, this initial uh, state check because uh, for the right pair, we start from zero to, so we always got a single state. But for the left pair, because we randomly load two spins, so there will be some probability we load a single state, but also some probability that we load a triple state. So you can see that by doing the measurement, we got either a single single state or a triple single state. And what we need to do for this uh, triple single initialization is we just need to post-select the initial states. Uh, we just need to uh, post-select the, the shots where we actually start from those uh, initial states. Yeah. Okay, so we have this. And the first thing we want to uh, study in this system is to study the energy spectrum in the spectrum of the spin systems. Uh, so how do we do that? To explain this, I want to start from a two spin system, which is easier to understand. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, across, uh, across this uh, interdot transition or along this detuning, your, your energy spectrum looks like this. You have this single state and a triplet state. So how do um, we- Just a question there, Tsuk, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you again. Uh, a, a question on the triplet states here. So we have a question from Giovanni Oaks who asks, do you have a B field applied or are the three triplet states and the singlet degenerate? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's also a good question. I also missed that, I should mention it. Yes, we do have a magnetic field applied. It's usually in the order of uh, yeah, 200 or 100 mini Tesla just to split off. Uh, the t the t plus and the t minus state, uh, yeah, yeah. So indeed, those three triplets are not degenerate in this in our case. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so uh, where was I? Okay, we want to get the energy splitting basically between the this lower singular branch and the triplet state. Basically, we want to measure the exchange coupling between these two states. So how do we do that? Uh, as uh, I just talked about, yeah, actually that, that was exactly what I was talking uh, about. The, if you have B field equals to zero, your T zero, T plus and T minus are degenerate, right? However, if you add a magnetic field, you actually split up your T plus and T minus state. Okay, so now it's, uh, now the, 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 um, the energy diagram looks like this. So how do we get the, uh, the exchange couplings as a function of the detuning? Uh, so what one thing we typically do is that we start from initialize a single state uh, from just basically start from a zero two charge state that automatically give you a single zero two. And then we quickly move our detuning uh, along. So basically we move the detuning and then if we move our detuning to a point where this singlet is aligned with uh, the T plus state. And then because of the uh, spin orbital coupling and the uh, uh, hyperfine, hyperfine field caused by the nuclear spins, you will have singlet, uh, you have the mixing between the single state and the T plus state. So if you go to this, uh, this point, you have a very small anti-crossing there. And if you stay there for some time, and then you have leakage from the single state to the T plus state. And then what you need to do is to basically pulse back your detuning. And if you have some leakage to your triplet state and you pulse back and do a, a PSB readout, a poly, poly spin blockade readout to measure the singlet and triplet outcomes. And you will see that your, sing, your triplet outcome actually increases if your detuning point is where the singlet match with the T plus. So you can do this, uh, this experiment by changing the detuning and the magnetic field. And by doing that, you got uh, a signal look like this. So basically this, this is uh, the triplet outcome as a function of the detuning and the magnetic field. So that you can see that you can probe this uh, this energy difference between the single state and the uh, and the T and the, the triplet states. 
Yeah, so this is what we usually call a spin funnel. It's a good way to, it's a, it's a very uh, typical way to give you the, uh, the energy splitting between the single and triple state. And also this is the, the, basically the high of this is the exchange coupling. Okay, so this is the uh, two spin system. Uh, obviously in the four spin system, it will be more complicated. Uh, we can start from this uh, numerical simulation in the four spin system. And if we only focus on one of the global triplet states, you will see that if you uh, start from a condition where J12 equals to J34, and then if you start from, and if you first turn off J23, and you will see that actually the, the triplet single state and the single triplet state is almost degenerate, right? Because if there is no middle exchange and, and J12 equals to J34, then these two, they should be degenerate, right? And then, uh, and, and there's a, a third state up here. And as you increase the middle exchange, so you start to couple these two single triplet pairs and you start to see that these two energy, they start to hybridize and cause a splitting. Yeah, and also, also you have some split, uh, hybridization between uh, also this state. So that, that you will see that at some point, this one will also start to uh, hybridize and start to bend. <clears throat> uh, yeah. Okay. So yeah, this is a numerical simulation. And how do we get this energy diagram in the, in the experiments? We will start from a single single initial state. So in the two in the two spin case, we just start from a single state, right? So in the four spin state, in the four spin system, we start from a single single product state as an initial state, and we fix the outer two to be equal as the initial condition. Then we will scan the magnetic field and uh, the detuning between these two. Uh, quantum dot essentially changing the middle exchange. And we wait for some time and we do a single triplet readout. And this is the outcome uh, we have, we got from the experiment. You can see that uh, basically these four panels is the, uh, each of them is the outcome of different uh, single triplet correlation measurement. So this uh, bottom left panel is the single single outcome and uh, the top right panel is the triplet triplet outcome. Uh, you can see that since we start from a single single initial initial states, if this uh, initial state does not uh, align with any of the spin states, and you post back to do a measurement, you will still get a very high probability uh, to be a single single state. That's what all this uh, yellowish region gives you. Basically, you don't have any crossing between uh, the, the single single initial state to any of these any of these spin states. So your uh, single single probability remains high. However, very interestingly, if you at some point with certain uh, detuning a certain magnetic field, you you actually align with one of these uh, spin states, you actually have leakage to those spin states. Once you have leakage, you will see that your single single probability actually decrease. And as you de as the single single probability decrease, the triple single probability and the tri a single triple probability actually increase, right? You see. So that just tells you that actually have you, you have leakage from one uh, from this single single initial state to different spin states. Right? And then by doing this uh, experiment uh, as a function of detuning and the magnetic field, you got many different branches, uh, you, many different uh, branches in your, uh, in your measurement. And actually those corresponds to the different states in this numerical simulation. Okay, all clear? Okay, I'll continue. And we can also do uh, something different. We can also, uh, by starting certain, starting with certain initial states 
and we can turn on the exchange coupling quickly and see how the four spin state evolve uh, under this mutual uh, exchange, exchange couplings between four spins. Uh, so the power sequence will look like this. Initially, we have almost zero uh, middle exchange, J23. And at some point, we turn on the exchange and we let it evolve for some time. And then we turn off the exchange and we do the, uh, the correlation measurement. So in, and in this figure, what we show is that where we initialize a, a single, single product states and then turn on the exchange and see how the, uh, the single, single state evolve under uh, the Hamiltonian, the, the Heisenberg Hamiltonian as a function of time and the middle exchange. And you can see that we can see some clear uh, periodic oscillation. This corresponds to the, cor the oscillation between this state and this state, okay? Because, uh, uh, because, because you start from this initial state, you will only evolve uh, within this subspace. So it's within, it's, uh, yeah, it's evolved between the zero and the one state I show here. And you can also starting from a different state, which is a triplet single state using the post selection technique I mentioned earlier, and do the same thing. You can see, you can see an even more clear uh, coherent oscillation. Yeah. And this oscillation is actually the coherent uh, oscillation between the three different states in this global triplet subspace. Yeah. And this shows that we have good control and we can actually observe clear uh, <clears throat> four spin exchange oscillation in our system. And as I mentioned earlier that actually we can still see uh, quite clearly those coherent effect uh, up to 60 nanoseconds. Okay. Right, okay, so the, the final experiment we want to do uh, in this spin chain simulation is that we want to first achieve equal uh, homogeneous exchange. And then, as I mentioned earlier, that the antiferromagnetic ground state, you can write it down in the two, one, two, three, four basis like this, or one, four, two, three basis like this. Uh, and you can see that if you write down in the one, four, two, three uh, spin pair basis, if we do a middle pair, if we measure the middle pair using PSB, you will get 50 singular and 50 triplet probability. And uh, if we measure, instead, if we measure uh, use in the outer pair, uh, in the outer pairs, we'll get actually 93% single, single outcome and 70% triplet, triplet outcome. <clears throat> and but the question is, how do we get this uh, antiferromagnetic ground state? The way we prepare this antiferromagnetic ground state is by doing uh, adiabatic ramp. So here you can see that this is the uh, the uh, the energy energy of the, the sorry the energy diagram in the uh, in the single in a global singular subspace, you will see that as we increase the uh, the middle exchange, you will go from uh, a state where you have single you have the product single 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 product state, and move to a uh, point you have where you have this uh, antiferromagnetic ground state. So how do we achieve this point? It's actually quite easy. You just have to move adiabatically so that this, uh, your state will follow this, this branch and end up in the antiferromagnetic ground state. So uh, to, be more, uh, to be more specific, what we do in the, in the post sequence is that we start from, so we start from the, uh, the single, single initial states and then we slowly ramp our middle exchange such that it moves slowly uh, along this branch and reach the point where the three exchanges are equal. Uh, then we just stay there for some time and then we pulse out. <clears throat> and then uh, after we pulse out, we will measure uh, the, 
the four spins using the power spin bucket. Okay, so as I just mentioned earlier, that if, if we successfully prepare this antiferromagnetic ground state, if we measure the, the middle pair, we can actually get 50% of singlet and 50% of triplet. That's what we see here. Uh, this dash line is where the three exchanges are equal. And you can see that, uh, and this orange curve is the, uh, the triplet probability if we measure the middle pair, and this is the, the single probability. And you can see that exactly at this, uh, at the point of this dash line, we got uh, equal probability of single and triplet. And also, if we measure the same antifragmentic ground state uh, using the outer pair uh, readout, we'll get 93% single single outcome and 70% triplet triplet outcome. And also, that's what we see here. When we do uh, a, a correlation measurement of these two pairs, we got very high uh, single single outcome and, and low uh, triplet triplet outcome here which matches the, the numerical simulation uh, we did. Okay, uh, that's uh, all my talk today. So the conclusion is that you can use, so uh, yeah, so here's my summary. I, uh, you can use a highly controllable quantum system uh, to use it as an analog quantum simulator to study physics uh, under different models. And I hope I, today I have already and show you that the gate by Coronado Array is a promising platform for common simulation of Fermi Harbor and Heisenberg models. And I show that we can actually use uh, our Coronado Array to study uh, different uh, phenomena like a uh, more metal to insulator transition, Nagoka ferromagnetism, and the, the main part of this work, the Heisenberg spin chain. Yeah, okay, so that's uh, all my talk today. Thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Sukan, for, for a really clear and, and, and nice talk. Um, let's see, um, everybody, if, if, if there's anyone who has any questions, please uh, raise your hand or write them in the Q&A button or write them in the chat or, or in any way uh, let us know. So I see that uh, Crispin Barnes has already raised his hand. So Crispin. I don't, yes, really enjoyed the talk. Thanks uh, very much. Yeah, very thanks. interesting. Um, I just from sort of personal curiosity, your could you go back to your slide with the the, the Fermi uh, Hubbard Hamiltonian on it? Yeah. So, so it's a ways yeah. back. Yes, it was. Yeah. It, yes, this one. So um, I mean, the Hubbard term is U N I N I, but you've got a term. You've got an extra minus um, ni upon two there, which is kind of a, um, basically a local, <clears throat> and it, in some ways it belongs to the local energy offset term. Um, um, you are talking about the second term or the first yeah, term? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, I'm talking about this minus one inside the charging energy term. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, it's just I, un unfamiliar to me. And so, uh, uh, and I can I, see- I guess yeah, okay, I, I guess the, the point is just uh, if you have, uh, if you Ni is two, then you have this charging energy. Basically, when you have two charges in the same dot, then yeah, there will be charging energy. But if your N is one, then there's no charging energy. But if I if I put into your formula there that, um, oh, right, so if Ni is two, okay, okay. Right. So Ni is two, you have U. If Ni is one, it's zero. Oh, right. Okay, because of yeah. course the Hubbard term would be Ni spin up, Ni spin down. Um, and so this, yeah. right, okay, mm -hmm. because you haven't put spin into this. Yeah, yeah, here, here I don't put spins, yeah. yeah. Right. But, but here you do, we do have spins, yeah. Right. So to get the Heisenberg limit, Mm -hmm. um, I think you, you do need to put spin into that term. Otherwise, you're going to end up, I think, with an icing model. Uh, well, but OK. Yes, but the, the Ni here is, you can say it's the, it's the sum. Here is the sum of the, uh, 
the, the two two spins, right? The two yeah. spins, right? Yes. Yeah. No, I, I think the spins there. The spins there. The spins there. Yes. It, it 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 that I I I miss that yes and maybe Hugo has some comment on that. Have you looked at this particular specific Hamiltonian, Hugo? Well, I mean, in this case, this is just a, a clever way of writing the. Um, yeah, I guess that's just a different way of writing. I that, I, I, I just uh, copy pasted from one of our earliest earlier paper. Yeah, uh, it, it's just to include one term that is the same regardless of whether you have one or two particles right and yeah or one or two electrons and instead of coming up with two equations one in the case where you only have one and one in the case where you have two this sort of encapsulates both together where it'll just eliminate the term when you don't have uh, two particles yeah i think so okay thanks very much very good excellent do we have any other questions? Whilst people think if they have any other questions, I'll, I'll ask you, Sukan, um, like what, what's the next problem to look at? And, and you know, how, how many qubits do you think we need before this, this becomes something that's actually useful? Yeah, it's an excellent question. Uh, let's see. You, you still see it, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So the next uh, topic we want to study is a spin ladder. So a spin ladder is essentially you couple two spin chains uh, with uh, yeah with uh, so we have one chain here and one chain here. You have an inter chain exchange couplings that gives you a spin ladder, and and in the in the finite spin chain we know that there is no spin gap between the s equals to zero and the s equals to one states is gapless. However, for two leg spin ladder, and then you will always have, it's, it's a gap system. Um, yeah, so that's something that we are interested in and want to study. Uh, hopefully we can study something like hole pairing if we dope uh, two holes in the system. Yeah, and uh, the, our recent progress is to make a small, small version of this basically we have a two by four quantum dot array in germanian uh, and you can see that we have two by four quantum dot array and uh, we have already achieved a single charge occupation in this quantum dot array so and we can tune the tunnel couplings between all these uh, different dot pairs uh, we are moving on to study yeah, this uh, spin ladder physics. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, it doesn't look like we have any more questions at at this point. So okay. I, oh, I I have one. We more. have one. Yeah. Okay. So um, could you go back to your um uh, whole uh, spin velocity uh, slide? Yeah. Okay. The constant. Yeah. Yeah. This one. Right. Um, is is this from your this this is no, not this, no no this is not from my group. It's not from your from your group, right? Yeah. But it's yeah, it's this, this, is, this ultra yeah this is ultra core system. Yeah. Ultra so I, I was just thinking about your former supervisor's work, Chris Ford, who has sadly yeah. disappeared. Um, <laughs> you know, he was yeah. studying the Lutinger liquid. Yeah. Um, and so this in in your experimental system, mm -hmm. um, I think you might be able to look at a proper charge density wave in addition to looking at a spin density wave because the the charge on each of your quantum dot sites can probably move from side to side yes yeah so you know if you if you think of the chain this one knocks this one etc and you can get a um a, a proper charge density wave mm -hmm. and that is that is something that possibly could i mean it would be quite a lot more complicated but it could be could be simulated you just need to find some way of kind of knocking that chain to to actually see those oscillations. Many years ago, um, we did experiments with surface acoustic waves, which yeah. you must be very familiar with, where mm. this was worked by a Masaya Kataoka mm. and company, yeah. where um, we saw the charge oscillating from side to side in, in a quantum well. Um, 
Mm -hmm. I can send you references for it yeah. if you like. Uh, um, I, I think about the one you sent this cup two two channels, then you see an electron uh, moving. Yeah, exactly. Like that. And yeah, so yeah, that, yeah, I, yeah, I know that one. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. that so that um that sort of oscillation, but along a mm -hmm. chain, um, would I think be closer to the kind of Luttinger type model. Um mm. I mean, I, I haven't really followed it that closely, but as far as I understand, they, they've moved away now from just the linear model and now have some kind of quadratic mm -hmm. model for those spin and charge density waves. And so I, th I think you're, you're potentially in a really interesting position to, to study those sorts of excitations um, in, in, your, in the system you have right now. So, sorry, I think I missed uh, like, 10 seconds, uh, what you were saying earlier. Oh, right. So, yeah. <laughs> no, I'll repeat myself then. Yeah, I think sorry, sorry. If you, yeah. if you go to your, your figure with the, the line of quantum dots and detectors. Like this one. Yeah, yeah that's it. So if there was some way to create a, a, a charge density wave in that mm -hmm. by pushing yeah. it from the left end. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you just, okay, and like a Newton's cradle, yeah? You just, bang the first one and, and, and see how the, the charge density wave uh, propagates or um, okay. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that, 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 that will be closer to the sort of model that, uh, uh, that people are, are studying in these one dimensional mm -hmm. systems. So, and, so, and a, a so, this, uh, so you will expect to see uh, a coherent oscillation of this. Yeah, absolutely. Wave or... yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it but can that, get that... quite complicated. One of my former master's students did exactly this uh, simulation of a bunch of charges in a spin. And then if you have one banged, how this propagates through the system. Mm -hmm. And it can get quite uh, messy, depending on if you're also trying to do operations and, and swaps at the same time. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, the if if you were to bang one, it does propagate all through the all through the wave, or, or all the, through the chain. I mean the chain. I mean, I, I would think that you could probably do it by suddenly populating one dot. If all the others were yeah, occupied yeah, and sorry. the first one was empty, then yeah. could you not just jump an electron into the first dot and mm -hmm. then? Yeah look to see whether the final electron jumps out like a Newton's cradle type thing. It might be an interesting. Yeah, yeah. But, but uh, is this uh, coherent? I mean, uh, or do, do you actually see this or you just keep the, the last electron out? Because of, it, uh, yeah, it's absolutely, it's a, it's a charge density wave. Mm -hmm. um, maybe have a look at some of Chris Ford's recent papers on okay, okay. Uh, his 1D, 2D tunneling and- uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, the and, and the earlier papers on the Lussinger model, and you'll you'll see in one D systems this uh, spin charge separation. Mm -hmm. They have they have diff two different velocities, rather like okay. the the initial slide. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Th thank you very much, Sukh, yeah, no for for no for, for giving this talk and and next time you're in Cambridge, please, please let us know. So, yeah, so we can actually, I think I'll be there pretty soon in uh, one or two months time. 